Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all to our COIL conversation today. Um, our get, guest is Rich Kiker, and Rich is, as you can see on the screen there, the Director of Online Learning at Palisade School District, which happens to be in Pennsylvania. We just uh, worked through. It is not in California. And uh, Rich is also very active in the Google Education Trainer Program and uh, has traveled worldwide uh, introducing the, the Chromebook and the platform the suite of Google tools and how it might be used in, in education. And I'm presuming there, Rich, you're mostly speaking about K-12 to uh, education. So, um, so a few things. One is uh, Rich and I got connected through LinkedIn, of all places, and uh, we had a conversation one day about you know, what he's doing and the kinds of things he's looking at. I thought it would be a really interesting conversation for Coil Conversation. It's it's a different target audience that we usually than we usually uh, work with at K to 12, but uh, from my experience, that was the environment I started out in in my career as a high school teacher. Um, I know there's a lot of great innovation going on there, uh, as well as challenges. So I think for our environment today, we'll be interested in in looking at those um, opportunities and challenges. So with that, Rich. Um, I've already asked that, uh, that Rich talks for you know, 30, 35 minutes, gives us an overview of some of his ideas on uh, blended learning in the K-12 environment, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. So uh, with that, Rich, we'll turn it over to you. That sounds good, Larry. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. If it is afternoon where you are, I think Larry makes a, a really good point there. I think uh, we get students first, right? So we have to hold up our end before they get to higher ed, before we send them out to careers. What is the set of skills that is the most authentic, the most relevant, and the, will give them the most impact, I guess, into what they're going to do, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this and what we do here at Palisade School District out in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and kind of a, a general overview of our, our program, and I'd love to hear your questions, thoughts as they emerge. Uh, as Larry alluded to, Director of Online Learning here, um, and I want to just make a quick note for those of you who are just joining us that didn't hear Larry and I chattering oh. away. This is a first, probably, for this group. I'm presenting from a Google Chromebook, which is a cloud-based operating system and a more mobile device. And I, you know, we tested the Adobe software and everything else. It worked wonderfully, and it seems to be doing so today as well. So a very interesting time it's moving you know, from local computing that we've always done in, in K-12 and certainly in, in higher ed as well, and starting to look at more cloud-based devices as the cloud moves into the predominant platform, it seems like, for productivity and other connected learning opportunities. So uh, I think all of you can see these, these slides. I was going to run through these slides a little bit to start the conversation, give you an overview, the general solutions, <clears throat> excuse me, that we've implemented here at Palisades, and talk about this idea <clears throat> of using blended learning as a conduit to future ready. This audience may not be as familiar with the Future Ready initiatives out of the U.S. Department of Education. The Future Ready initiative is, a, is an effort by the national government. There's really two parts. Uh, there's the Connect Ed initiative to get 99% of our K-12 schools connected in the next four years now. It was originally five years. And now this effort to be future ready. What does it mean for a school district to be future ready? What does it mean for a school district to be setting up and delivering and having systems and processes of learning that are preparing students for the future, making them ready for this future. I'm honored to share with this audience that we were just interviewed by the Department of Ed uh, a couple weeks ago. They were here on site, and they recorded us as one of nine school districts in the United States that will be spotlight schools come August for the Department of Education in what future ready looks like and how other schools can prepare their own programs to be future ready. So that's why I shared here blended learning as a conduit to future ready. Talk a little bit about why blended learning. A lot of facts coming at you here and a lot of things we're doing at Palisades and a little bit about our culture and our pedagogy on what we're trying to design for schools. But jumping in, I'll start with this idea of, of readiness. Again, so this ties to the future ready idea. I love this photograph. It says a lot about some of the things we're trying to drive and some of the programs we're trying to create and build upon here at Palisades. This, of course, is a, uh, looks like a U.S. Navy officer who is working with these two boys, and they're, they're using his mobile device. And if anyone has children, you know exactly what's going on here. The youngest boy there is looking at a game or something or playing music, 
and the older brother's coming in for the steal, and he's got the full defense move with his left hand up there, which I find wonderful. Um, but of course, the academic value here is that you know there's going to be more mobile phones than people on Earth, or should be more mobile devices than people on Earth here in the next year or so. And that's a challenging situation for schools, right? We're still stuck in the K-12 mindset that you know you get to the front door, you put your device away, and that type of connected uh, world doesn't exist from 7.30 to 3 or whatever hours of the day it is. And then kids are running out of the building at the end of the day, and you see cell phones coming out of every package, pocket, everywhere, and they're getting reconnected to their world. I have a couple friends that talk about uh, most notably, this superintendent in Wisconsin, Joe Sanfilippo, who talks about, you know, he's never heard a student say, boy, I can't wait to go home and check out the school's website and see what the latest information is. He talks about meeting people where they are and that, you know what, if your school is going to meet your parents and your students and your community, you better be on Facebook, you better be using Twitter, you better connect to people where they are because otherwise you're trying to force people to do something that way we've always done it and that has never worked throughout history. So we're thinking about this idea of readiness and the state of being fully prepared for something differently at Palisades. We talk a lot about agility and how these types of executive functioning skills, these types of soft skills that we're trying to prepare students with, like being agile. What does it mean to be flexible and, and being able to look at a situation and not look at it as a fear uh, a fear component or change and being uncomfortable with it, but to embrace it and helping our students see that there's all these different opportunities out there. You may start your life as a fashion designer and you may end as an accountant and that happens a lot. So we try to tell our students, you know, that's what we're trying to get you ready for. There's not one thing we're trying to prepare you for. There's not a fixed range of careers or opportunities in life that we want to prepare you for, but we want to embrace this overall skill set of readiness so that when you leave here, you go on to higher education or you go on to your careers, you're ready for that. So we focus a lot on this idea of being agile learners. Growth mindset, of course, Carol Dweck's position and her book and her work around this idea. Um, I talk a lot about grit and the idea that grittiness is valuable and what blended learning does for us in the space certainly gives our kids the ability to, to learn in different ways, to get to information and acquire knowledge in different ways, but it also gives them a full range of these, let's call them uh, modalities, right? So face-to-face, -face, online, blended. The truth is, if we're having a growth mindset as a district, if we're doing this at Palisades, wouldn't we be foolish if we weren't looking at all the opportunities to get our students to growth mindsets? With all those different modalities, our kids have different experiences, their range, their total capacity with technology and learning grows, and we want to drive this idea. We want to make sure that our students um, you know, are expanding their experience and understanding how people learn in the world, because we know that if they leave here and if they work at a car dealership, or if they are an accountant, or if they go into the medical field, online learning, professional development, and the ability to draw on information on demand is one of the most powerful skills for our learners. So we try to focus in on this whole piece of the growth mindset. So flexible competencies. Obviously this person right here had a wonderful career, uh, but this job probably doesn't exist anymore. I alluded to this a little bit when I talked about agility, but we're not going to focus on the idea that we need to only learn the Pythagorean theorem one way. That when you learn the Pythagorean theorem and about right triangles or any other example in education, there's one way to do it, and that's the only way to do it correctly. We want to try to think about it differently. You know, so whether you leave here and you are a graphic designer or you're a civil engineer or whatever it is that you choose to do with your life, that your understanding and your knowledge acquisition around something like the Pythagorean theorem is transferable. Of course, Grant Wiggins' work says a lot about this idea too acquisition of knowledge, making meaning for learners, and then transferring that knowledge and meaning into the workforce, into your career, into your you know, creating a happy life for yourself. So we don't think about competencies as standards, like we have the PA state standards, and of course we have to hit those standards, but we want to think bigger than that. And we like to think that we're doing what all great organiz organizations do. 
We don't think about incremental improvements. We want to think about improvements 10 times out because if we're shooting way out there and we're trying to make our programs so much better, so much more interactive, all the way out here, then the process of getting there will continually inform and improve every other learning system. You know, hopefully it'll even improve our community programs. It'll improve how we engage our uh, entire community from parents to taxpayers to our students. And we really try to drive that home. So this idea of flexible competencies is, is part of that. One of the reasons that we started a blended learning program four years ago is because we had students who wanted to choose a full-time cyber program. And at the time, it continues to be, it was a real challenge in K-12. You know, how do you handle you know, staffing resources? What does that curriculum look like? Where are we going to get online content from? And I think the easy answer here is for many school districts to look at that process and say, mm, you know what, things are going well. Our AP exam scores are good. Our kids are going, you know, 86% of our students are going on to higher education. We don't want to rock the boat a little bit. And that's a tough decision, right? And I think Carol Dweck actually talks about this with growth mindset, but true leadership and true, you know, good organizational design looks at, okay, yeah, things are going well, but is it going well in the way that we need them to go? Can't take away what good teaching was 20 years ago. We don't want to forget those great practices, but we also don't want to stay stagnant and get left behind. So when we looked at this problem, we thought about, okay, how do we tackle this, get everybody involved, bring our teams together from, again, parents and teachers, and everybody comes together to kind of design this program. And we tackled it head on. And I, I constantly say, we're moving fast. And I know it's hard to move fast, but it's something you have to do because if you're not moving fast, you're getting left behind. And so in our whole design process, we are constantly reflecting, remediating, accelerating, and doing all these things. I guess you can say building the plane as it goes. You get something, a really great product, you deliver a great product, but you never stop the improvement process. And that includes professional development, that includes student acquisition of, of uh, processes and procedures and the best practices, and then ways to constantly improve our space and our school in total. So this blended learning, what is it giving Palisades? What are we doing internally and, and how does that impact our students and their success and their achievement, of course? Well, content, right? Um, so if you see here, this is a library, a very nice library, although this, uh, let's hope books never go away, certainly not for reading and personal appreciation and uh, our own love of reading. But the idea of a library as a data center is archaic, and we had to come to that appreciation here at Palisades. You know, research and you know, the depth of knowledge that we need our students to be able to access in terms of primary sources, you can't build a library big enough to compete with the internet. So we had to really be honest with ourselves about that. What are we doing and how are we providing resources and materials to, to students? Also, this idea of content Palisades has worked very hard to partner with other school districts, to partner with the Blended Schools Network here in Pennsylvania, and others to share resources because we don't want to be silos of our own information. We want to share what we're doing, we want to help other schools improve, and then of course we want to learn from other schools. We don't want to uh, live in our own space. We feel like not only do our students have the opportunity to use online learning to increase their knowledge, but we do. So we can connect via webinars like this or conversations like this. We can connect with other districts face to face and share ideas and, and processes. So that's important to us. And so we want to focus on giving access to the endless content online, it seems. I also had this big piece here about uh, time and space and what that means. So when I was still teaching, I taught here at Palisades. And I was in a one-to-one -one program years ago in our district back in the uh, Classrooms for the Future grant or uh, if anyone in this room is from Pennsylvania and remembers that time. But one of the big advantages I learned quickly with one-to-one -one is how it created time and space for both autonomy to the learners and inquiry-based learning. When I say time and space, I have, of course, a, a sports analogy here. These gentlemen are playing soccer and uh, I played soccer growing up and I remember always talking about if you can't do something, if you're in a jam, try to create time or try to create space or play, make a play 
to open space. I feel like our K-12 system, our secondary level instruction for sure, is just beaten down day after day to students. I mean, if you think about how hard it is for us to go to a conference and go to three or four sessions throughout the day, and then you leave and your head is, you're overwhelmed with information. Our students do that every single day. And sometimes in traditional scheduling, they'll have 45 minutes of English, 45 minutes of math, 45 minutes of social studies. They get a 23 minute lunch or something like that. And we constantly are just in this rote process. And I think there's better ways to do that. Blended learning, this idea of mass customized learning in the blended learning space, does exactly this in terms of time and space. If I'm in the classroom, I'm driving a blended process, I allow students to have autonomy. A lot of times it will allow me to let them decide the ways that they want to choose to demonstrate proficiency or mastery. They can you know, enrich with a really good designed online course. They can remediate with a course. The teacher then is freed up to break out into small conversations over here or to get in the mix and help students code something over here. Or maybe it's not a coding class. Maybe you're getting into uh, literature and discussing setting and plot and those kind of things and denouement, all that stuff I know nothing about because I haven't spent any time with it since high school. But the idea that because of the range of modalities and because content can move and the teacher doesn't have to be the dictator or the only fountainhead of knowledge anymore, it frees the teacher up to be back into an artistry role where they are that artist in the classroom and they can design learning and not just instruction but actual learning and be different about it and do all these kind of wonderful things that we want them to be. A lot here about teachers being part of the learning community, not the head of the learning community. That everyone in the classroom is a learner. And with connected devices and our blended learning models, a lot of our team has been very successful at doing just that. This idea of bricks and clicks, interesting enough, right before this meeting, we had a cyber committee meeting for our cyber program. And we were talking about how we still don't believe that a full online program is the right model for any K-12 student. Although we have many who want to choose that and we have to honor their wishes because that's what they're, they're doing. It's a very small percentage of students who can thrive in a full online program. Because of that, we really drove home this idea of bricks and clicks. We have a cyber center here at our high school that's staffed every day with a full-time teacher with a special education certificate. It's a teacher who's very well versed in supporting students. In fact, she plays several roles during the day in supporting all of our learners in our classrooms, not just our students who are choosing a blended schedule here at Palisades. While I can make an argument that online learning isn't, the, or full online learning isn't the best model for our, for our children right now, I can make a very strong argument that full face-to-face -face learning is not the best anymore either, mostly because of some of those reasons I just shared the idea is that you know, it's rote and you just go through this continual process. There's no way to, to break up or differentiate the day, the time, or the space. So this whole idea of bricks and clicks. Students can report to our building. It's kind of like an open campus, almost like a, like a college or a community college. They can report here midday, go to the cyber center, work on their courses, gives us a place to have them, to, uh, have them report to when they may be deficient in a couple areas or they're falling behind or their grades are slipping. We can get them back in until we get them up to grade level or achieving in a more productive manner uh, at some point. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to do things in our space. So what's next? How do we prepare learners moving, moving forward here? There's a lot that we're trying to do, a lot of things we're trying to focus in on. Uh, if you look at this demographic, or excuse me, this infographic right here, this is what happens in the internet in a, in a, on the internet in a minute. And I feel like this is dated the minute you take it and you use it, right? So uh, looking at this, you can see how many posts, how many searches. This is what's happening in our world every 60 seconds. It's profound. This is the world that we have to get these students ready for. There's actually, I hope you have access to these slides. On this slide deck in the upper right-hand corner, You'll see there's a link that says 200 countries in 200 years in four minutes. It's a great, absolutely wonderful simulation from the BBC. And it's on YouTube, and it talks about how 200 years ago, the West was separating from the rest of the world. And we were moving up in both you know, healthcare and life expectancy and wealth. 
And then it's interesting over the last 40 years how the rest of the world has caught up, has caught up with us in, here in the West, right? How China and India and Pakistan and, well, not, maybe not Pakistan, but uh, Singapore and some others have exploding economies and they are achieving, you know, Western uh, economies and trade and focusing on these, these components and everyone else is starting to get there. It really drives home the idea of the global economy and the global society. Some of these competencies, these global competencies that we want our students to have. I had a student when I was still teaching here in this whole blended learning process, even when we started it seven, eight years ago, who was connecting with a student in Japan whose obviously primary language was Japanese and this student was English and as part of his inquiry project in his blended learning space, they were teaching each other their native language, which I thought was wonderful, uh, a wonderful opportunity, not only culturally, not only about global awareness and understanding, but just really cool in the ways that you can use technology to be a learner. And so we were doing that eight years ago, and that's kind of where we started. So this is what happens in a minute. We want to stay aware of this. We want to stay that stay aware that again we're not a silo at Palisades, and the world exists in a very large capacity beyond our doors. There's so much happening that we need to get kids to be able to see and experience. We see it as our responsibility to do that. Talk a lot about these ideas of immersive experiences, the ability that uh, our students can go online, attend virtual conferences that they can learn from Khan Academy or participate or learn from TED Talks or build their own learning systems. And we're passionate about that. And we try to drive it into all of our K-12 instructional models if we, if we can. Uh, this doesn't happen overnight. This takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And we're certainly not, not at uh, the end. We haven't reached the goal. I don't even know if we've defined that goal because every year it seems to change. So we continue to drive towards creating more and more immersive experiences, getting kids in a place where a culture of learning and the opportunity for accidental conversations and coincidental learning is just there for the taking. And so we try to get them into these spaces and experiences as well. Bandwidth. So maybe, maybe the most important investment in any school district, K-12, to moving forward is bandwidth. Because if your pipe isn't big enough, if you do not have enough ability or capacity to get significant throughput in terms of information into the hands of your students, and that's both with bandwidth in terms of, well, in access in terms of bandwidth and devices per learner, then that child is at a competitive disadvantage. And we see it that way and we define it as such. If we're not providing that to them, someone else in the world is or will be, and our students then are not getting that type of connectivity. This ties a little bit to that Connect Ed initiative I mentioned by the U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, but for us, this has always been principal. Every year, we're trying to figure out new ways to increase bandwidth, improve our throughput, and get more devices in the hands of our students so that experience can happen. Obviously, if you have a, band, if you have a pipeline that's this big, and that's where all your knowledge is coming in, or your pipeline is this big, I obviously want to be in the second scenario, and I want our students to be in the same space. Information literacy, so again, these executive functioning components, analysis, synthesis, synthesis, interpretation, curation, and validation. You know, how do we use information effectively? How do we keep an eye on bias? How do we be active researchers and investigators and not just consumers of information that's published out there? This to me is a staggering, staggering statistic. It's actually a little old now, but I keep using it because I haven't found a new statistic just yet. But in the summer of 2013, IBM did a study and they found out that 90% of the world's data had been created in the previous two years. So that from the year summer of 2011 to the summer of 2013, that was 90% of the world's data. Every book, every piece of recorded information, every computer system before then was only 10% of the world's information. And that's a staggering number. So with this level, how do we help our kids weed through it? How do we teach them these new literacies? And how do we focus in on the ability to be, again, not just consumers, but investigators and, and researchers? 
I'll leave uh, the conversation here in this final little formula before we open up to some questions. The idea that what we're trying to do is this formula. So access, bandwidth, and devices. Getting our kids conduits to that knowledge, to the web, and moving from there. Plus this inquiry. I have a little icon here on blended learning methodologies. The fact that we have to establish curiosity and discovery in our kids because we know that's how the best learning happens, right? We have to let them be interested and curious, choose how they want to demonstrate these proficiencies and so on. Those things together is a simple formula, but it's a it's an overarching concept for getting our kids to opportunities. If we can do those things, access and inquiry, and inquiry includes things like what does it mean to be gritty and stay curious and do those kind of things, and that's what gets our kids to opportunities at the end. That opportunity could be getting into the college of their choice, that opportunity could be leaving here and working for a carpenter, or that opportunity could be just leading a happy and healthy life. Life. Um, wellness is also a big component of, of all that we do, but the idea that opportunity is the end goal here. We want them to have endless opportunity and these other pieces that we're trying to put together inform and support that process. So that's a lot of talking. I think I'm three minutes under, but I'm going to kind of uh, tone it out just a little bit from the direct instruction side, from the direct instruction side here, and see if we have any questions. It looks like uh, Jerry's asking some questions, and it looks like Larry's coming back in here, and I'd be happy to answer them. Larry, how, are you, how do you want to start the question section? Do you want to start, or should I just start talking to Jerry here? Well, yeah, you can start with Jerry. He's more important than I am. Um, but I do want to say that I have a, I have a list waiting for you, Rich. But then let's get started with Jerry there. I think he makes a really good point that um, not all right. Um, it might be, uh, Rich, would your speaker be on by any chance? My speaker is on. Does that work? Does that work? Okay. Okay. No. no. Yeah. It worked. It worked. It worked just it worked fine. Just fine. Well, let me check mine. No, now mine's on. I'll turn it off. So, um, Rich, you know, we have students who are um, challenged, let's say, who are not self-directed, not self-managed, or struggle in that area. Uh, and I'm wondering how this high-tech environment, I think this is Jerry's question, and Jerry, jump in if I'm not getting it quite right. But, um, how do we make adjustments to accommodate uh, those types of students and help them succeed? Yes, yeah, so really two parts here. I'm coming back off of mic. I, I muted my mic there for a minute because it looked like there was a lot of echoes, but back on, if there's any problems hearing, just uh, give me a thumbs up. But uh, two parts here. There's a lot of students who maybe aren't self-directed and aren't um, self-motivated learners. And I think what's really important for both modern teachers and modern schools to think about is let's not let go of all the good things that we've done in the past while driving into this new ecosystem. Let's not forget about differentiated instruction or uh, interventions or all these things that will help our learners achieve in different ways. You know what? If your demonstration is making a diorama, then you should be able to make a diorama because that shows proficiency in one shape or form or another. So we work hard at that. We also, as I mentioned, have these cyber centers. I can you know, share a little bit more on those, especially at our high school here, that really serves as a multi-purpose support center. So we have a student somewhere who's just really struggling and can use some technical support or maybe a different way to think about technology. They can report there and go see our either um, our media specialist or our cyber center person, uh, our cyber center teacher to help with that. The other piece here gets back to that idea. I said, you know, when you're doing good on AP scores and you're doing well in school, there's little, you know, it's hard to make change when things are going well, even when you know you need to change to be relevant. And we get a lot of pushback from high flying students, students who are thriving and doing really well, and they're like, hey, listen. I'm going to be a junior. I'm going to be a senior. I've got the school thing figured out. You know, I'm going to Penn State next year. Just let me finish doing what I'm doing and get out of here. Um, and that's a tough conversation, right? Because they're right. They're doing. They're doing well. But our answer and our commitment is around. You're doing well for today's classroom, even though we're in this transitioning period of education. 
if I let you just kind of wade through and continue to do these you know, things the you, way you've already done them, doesn't really get you prepared for what's coming at you, and that's our responsibility. I guess it goes to the idea in education that we have a lot of delayed gratification. We hope that what we're doing now, 20 years down the line, is helping a student thrive and, and so on. So really two parts there, not just the students who struggle uh, to be self-directed, but the ones who are thriving in a traditional setting, and how do we push them even harder? You know, um, I, I like that answer, Rich, and I, I think that it challenges us to think a little broader about what we do in education. You know, it's one thing that we're providing content and, and specific skill sets and competencies. It's another to think that we're preparing students as lifelong learners. Even in kindergarten, the idea that, you know, it ends in sixth grade or twelfth grade or fourteenth grade, pick, you know, pick the, it doesn't today. It's a, it's a continual a change in adjustment, so uh, I think you're right on. Um, Christine asks a, a really good question as well. Is, uh, we, we hear pushback and concerns a lot from uh, not only faculty, but we hear it from uh, parents sometimes about this learning space, uh, administrators and so forth. And um, as Christine said, these are sometimes emotional arguments. Uh, any suggestions that you must have run into some of these in, in the training that you've done with the, with the Google platform? Any suggestion about um, how we approach those situations? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I think strongly that the best way to combat these conversations is with really good um, evidence and uh, may, maybe research to a certain extent. I, I can give it, maybe the best way to tell this answer is in an example. We've had uh, flipped classrooms at our middle school for quite some time now. Flipped classrooms is one of the forms or modalities of blended learning that we implement here at the district. And you know that takes a huge, huge investment from the teacher, but then also the district in helping that teacher prepare to deliver in a new way. The first year or so that this one particular teacher did this flipped classroom, not so well. It was a growth period for sure. There was some frustration from parents and these kind of things like, hey, I didn't do it that way. I did fine. You know, let's just stick to the way things were going. We stuck to our idea that, well, we're going to continue to explore these new methodologies. We're going to continue to explore these pieces because we know they're good. Here's evidence on how students in flipped classrooms are performing on standardized tests. I hate to use standardized tests as the sole measure. It's one potential impact area. Right. Um, so stuck with it and support it and gave our teach this particular teacher a lot of support to the point where he has achieved to such a level that the last two years, Students in his class here in Pennsylvania on this uh, what's called the PVAS score, it's basically a year's worth of growth. Every single student has achieved greater the greatest level of growth in his math classroom because of this split classroom methodologies. So looking at that and tying change to evidence has been really successful for us. Uh, in in some ways, other places not not so much. Um, and then this idea of you know relevance of pulling in what's happening in the world, what you know, companies are looking for. Silicon Valley right now is talking about immigration policy because we don't have enough engineers and what does a modern engineer look like and having those conversations and trying to break down the doors for our own teachers as to what the role of the teacher in 2015 is and how it looks different than it did in 1985 and why that's important to, to address. They're really hard conversations. It takes a lot of tact, it takes a lot of care and an awful lot of empathy for, for the audience, but they're tough conversations we have to have. Rich, can I ask you, in, uh, along that uh, question that Christine posted, what's the, um, uh, I, I think I know the uh, general theme here, but um, what advantage is it for those individuals who have these emotional barriers to uh, even exploring some of these options? What's the value of having them somehow drawing them in, getting them involved in something. Maybe it's low stakes, maybe it's fun, but, but giving them the experience where they, they start to get the light bulb turned on. Have you seen that effective? Yeah, yeah, Larry, de definitely. I think um, we, we look at it sometimes as a district, you know, you're, you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? And that any good organization, and this is, this is another part of this conversation, Sometimes we talk about education as like a, as its own ecosystem that somehow it's disconnected and not 
relevant to the insurance industry or healthcare or uh, retail. And the truth is, it is. And any great organization is constantly looking for supports and opportunities to allow every single human resource, every single employee to grow professionally. And we see it as any way that we can raise the technical capacity of all of our team, whether it is you know just a low stakes entry level or um, someone who really struggles with technology, but they're willing to do formative assessments with something like a Google form or something like that. Raising all ships, or I guess what is that? What's that saying? The uh, a rising tide raises all ships, or something like that. So getting everyone's capacity up is a big effort of ours. That doesn't just exist in technology. That exists in our um, you know intervention programs, in the way that we do wellness and our wellness programs in the district. It's the the greatest good for the entire community. And I think I think our teachers have adopted that philosophy for the most part and have said, yeah, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. You know, it makes sense for everybody to be in the wellness program and for healthy foods to be implemented in the in the cafeteria. It also makes sense for a nice balance of technology in all instructional areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good, good points. You know, so as you're talking about this um, in this K to 12 space, I'm sort of projecting out as these students now are, are going to soon be making that step over into higher education. And I'm, I'm wondering, Rich, I know you've got a, a, a great K-12 to uh, understanding, and I, I would guess that you've got a great higher ed understanding. What do we need to be thinking about in now receiving these student, students who have you know, had cloud-based experiences, who have had experiences on mobile devices and all? What, what kind of pressure do you think that might put on higher ed? Yeah, no kidding, especially with all the conversations around millennials right now, right? And and the the ideology of the millennial entering the workforce and how human resources has to think differently. Um, you know, all that I'm hearing, Larry, out there in, in, in the world right now is the millennials or these new age entry level, um, uh, you know, workforce is they want autonomy, right? They want autonomy, they want choice to do what they love, and they want to they don't want to be in a systemic process of, of career and workflow and anymore. Um, and that's a big shift for everybody, right? That's a whole lot for everyone to get used to. Uh, I think, I think one of the ways you know, higher ed can, can help that process is exactly that, right? So um, maybe it's long term something like micro credentialing, you know, a, a, a series of 12 mini degrees instead of one big degree or something like that where students can build their own their own program. I know that's a big idea and probably far off, but the idea that you can kind of build your own engineering degree or build your own solution um, and still focusing on really great instruction and really great things that, you know, like Penn State or others have. And then also this idea of autonomy, right? So in this course, you know, traditionally in a college course, you enter and you get a syllabus and here's what you do to meet the syllabus. Um, not so much unlike a traditional high school class. Well, what what's that syllabus mean? Is there a way that students can choose proficiency or master or choose to get that A grade instead of um, you know what was laid out by previous uh, students or what what was created in the past? Is there a way to empower them more? That's the thing, right? First of all, it's a very inviting environment, but it also lets them understand that, well, I can own my work and I can own my demonstration, but then that's a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when they go into career, you know, everybody in the, in the workforce is talking about, you know, how do we embrace workers who, you know, autonomy but want a greater role in even the entry level position. You know, there's a lot of responsibility there. I think that's a subtle, a subtle piece, right? You can own your learning, and you can do those kind of things, and you can be empowered. But along with the empowerment and um, you know giving you that level of, I guess, autonomy again, but comes this responsibility. And I think that's important for us to do, and and maybe create in, in higher ed as well. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, it reminds me in the be beginning of the setup of this, you mentioned a word that. I'm beginning to hear now, you're the second person who's used this term and it just strikes me, but you use the word grit 
So, you know, it says to me, perseverance, soft skill. And I'm, and I'm wondering what the, um, you know, as we're, as we're preparing students in, to operate in this new world where it's, you know, it's high tech, it's fast, it's complex, uh, it's sometimes frustrating. And we know students today have a different perception of how they approach these problems. But I, so I'm wondering about, you know, and that is, okay, if it failed once, I just reboot and do it again. Um, but how, how do we teach things like grit and perseverance and, um, you know, staying, staying through it when it gets difficult? Is that something you think that comes normal or, help, uh, you know, um, automatic to this generation? Or is that something we still need to help them get prepared? Not at all. I don't think it comes um, naturally at all. I think it's those those types of soft skills, even uh, from grit to empathy, and those other functionings, those those characteristics we want developed that aren't necessarily in the textbook. I think a school's culture helps to establish that, right? Providing a lot of opportunities for extracurricular, uh, you know, extracurricular activities, um, being able to help students. Again, this idea of choice and technology sometimes plays a part here as well. If I'm a student and I have choice and autonomy because I've asked for it and because that's what I want to do in my classroom and it fails, one of the things that was a very successful conversation for me when I was doing this in the classroom was, hey, listen, you wanted to do this. It's failed now and you're upset about it. Now we need to figure out how you shift or how you pivot or how you make new uh, solutions to get to that demonstration because this is what you asked for and we're giving it to you but the outcomes are still the same we need to show proficiency and do those kind of things you know culture of support high accountability but high support is something we use here at Palisades as well there's actually uh, this idea of restorative practices that we use in the district high support high accountability and I think that culture inherently leads to grittiness you can probably make an argument for the way that children are raised at, at home, right? Parents that set a culture of expectations with a ton of support for their children and a loving, nurturing home, you're probably likely to have children that are coming out of that household being successful and having happy and healthy lives, right? Um, so not so much unlike that same idea we think of parenting. It's interesting how they connect so well. Yeah, I, I wonder, though, how much uh, of, I wonder. of today's you know, helicopter parenting as well is not healthy for the students, but I guess that's a whole nother conversation. We, maybe we won't go down that trail. Um, so let me, I've got one here on the, on the chat line. It's asking about what kind of assessments could be built into this autonomous blended learning methodology. So, you know, you're changing the location, you're changing the pace, you're, you're changing the ownership, if you will, the control maybe is a better term. Um, how do we bring in the assessment component creatively and authentically? Yeah, it's a good good question. I think we've done it in, in, in many ways, right? Uh, we started, before we really got tuned into our cyber program or our blended programs here, we were starting to focus on uh, online assessments and other ways of assessing students. And that could be a traditional assessment, right? So a, a, a test, let's say online testing uh, and doing that process. And that remains an, an option, right? Uh, but what else is there? So, you know, if traditionally we've had persuasive arguments or persuasive essays written in an English class, you know, now that we have blended learning, what other opportunities exist for that same demonstration? And maybe there's a way to amplify it. Maybe there's a way that uh, instead of just a persuasive essay as part of a persuasive argument process, maybe the essay is there, but maybe there's a companion blog where students are constantly coming back identifying primary resources, maybe video content, maybe news articles that support this argument throughout, let's say, a quarter or a semester or whatever, whatever it may be. So we're taking an initial assessment, we're tying it to a more sustained process, potentially, and that process is developing a whole other range of skills from publishing and research and primary sources and, and so on. I think the same can be said for something like um, let's say physics class where a student can come in and do a, a physics lab and maybe that's still part of some of the assessments because we don't want to forget the, what a physical lab looks like 
but maybe there's an opportunity to build a you know fluid dynamics simulation in a in a lab online or with some experiment or introduce computer programming to that to that class if it's an interest level if we're meeting them where they are in, in their interest levels. So thinking about it differently and having a you know back to what I said earlier, full online I don't think is good. I also don't think full face to face is good anymore. A blend of assessments that are more uh, give a, a better insight into the range of knowledge, right? Not this end of unit chapter exam, end of unit chapter exam, end of unit chapter exam. What else? How else can we make this uh, education process more meaningful and give us more data about how that child's learning? You know, and Jerry Brees makes you know, a comment, Jerry, uh, an observation. He says about grit, perseverance, uh, persistence is a function of uh, intermittent random reinforcement. But he says uh, at the end is really important, I think. Occasional and really important. success coupled with failure is, is a part. You know, so I'm thinking of these assessment strategies. It's also, I think, incumbent on us to build challenging um, almost failure prone kinds of experiences because that's oftentimes where we uh, where we learn we learn the richest from um, you know rather than setting it up so that every student is going to succeed and and accomplish everything we put out there uh, you know when you do that you may not be giving the student the challenge that they may need to really grow I love that for reasons. I was just quickly trying to look up a book. I can't remember if it was Made to Stick or uh, by, by the Heath Brothers. I can't remember which book it was that I was reading recently. And it was also talking very similar to what Jerry's saying here about grit and how grit is acquired, but that the idea of knowledge and acquisition for our students, the best brain theory right now, the best brain research says that this continual formative assessment you know, this retrieval process of what you just learned, retrieving it at the end of a lesson or the end of a class, and then a couple of days later, I guess, retrieving it again, getting it, this whole process of continual feedback loops and uh, formative assessments is the best way for knowledge acquisition to happen. That we don't want to forget little things like checkout quizzes, things we've always done, right? Let's not forget those things because they work really well. But then let's also tie it to big creative project-based learning opportunities when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, and I, I remember that the conversation in this book, so that reminds me a lot of what Jerry is, there, is saying there, you know, like everything it seems like in life, really good balance, right? So you recognize success, but if you just keep recognizing success and success and success, at some point it's like, what are you comparing success against? So uh, some failure is certainly, I think, a, a very important part of it. Well, you know, I have to tell you, I just, uh, I read a blog post last week and uh, the, the fellow said that you start off, every, every request should, should start um, with the answer no. And, and you know, at first you're like, okay, why? And then it, when you read through it further, he, he describes it as no begins the conversation. Yes ends the conversation, if you think about it. You know, and so um, challenging our students with and it may be no is a bit strong, but challenging the students to be digging deeper, thinking deeper, rather than the affirmations or the quick successes, maybe is not is not helping our students get there very uh, very effectively. Um, I'm glad you said that, Larry. There's. I was going to say one thing about that. Um, I think having a saying yes and having a propensity to say yes are two different things. Yeah. If I have a propensity to say yes, that means when you come to me, okay, I want to say yes, but you need to help me get to yes. Yeah. I want to help you get there. How do we get there together and how do we make that happen? I think that ties to that same idea. I love that. I love that point. Yeah, yeah, I, you're right. And um, I think sometimes I, I'll put myself in this category. I'm very quick to say yes. My, my desire is to, is to do that. And in doing that, I think I probably don't um, encourage as much of the creative thought process and rationalization as, as could be helpful to the learner. So, um, Rich, I'm wondering if you could address maybe this, this question in my mind. And I've seen this written about so much and talked about, and I'm just kind of curious as to your take on it. I've heard psychologists say, uh, well, maybe not psychologists, maybe they're armchair psychologists, people say, oh, children today 
are wired differently than children of pick your year, 20, 30, 50 years ago. And I, I've always said that's always grated on me some. I, I can't believe that the wiring, the neurological pathways and all are actually, and, and maybe I've got a, a psychologist here who can give me some insights as well. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are the students coming in wired differently? It's such, it's such a good question. I mean, if, if that's the case, over the last 50 years, we've probably gone through the fastest human evolution ever, right? If we're, if we're wired differently in 50 years. Um, I don't... 10 years. 10 years. 10 years. 10 years, right, right, 15 years, right. Uh, that would be profound. I, I don't know if we're, you know, wired differently. I think we certainly, our, our kids are um, exposed to media at a level that they've never been exposed to. So they learn in different ways. They've certainly become more visual learners because it's the way they've learned since they were young. I don't, I don't think that makes them wired differently. I think kids still come into school uh, wanting to be engaged, even if they don't say it, but wanting to have uh, a relationship. And you know, 25 years ago, a really great teacher probably had great relationships with their kids, right? They probably asked them, how are you doing? How was soccer last night? What'd you have for dinner? You know, and we're invested in their lives. I don't think that part has changed. I don't think that at all. I think our kids will turn to YouTube faster than they will, or if they even get a newspaper at home anymore, uh, they'll get their news from new, uh, from from YouTube. They'll get their, you know, all their information over streams as opposed to watching TV. Uh, I think that is true, but I don't think it wires them differently. I think at the core, education is still a relationship based process. And when you make strong relationships, you know, children want to do good for you. They know you want to do good for them. They want, they know you'll do good by them. I think that process is the same. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not fully convinced that the wiring is different just yet either, Larry. That's tough to say. Uh, hi, is this on? Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth White. I'm in the psychology department. And I think in terms of thinking about learning, I mean, learning happens in the brain, right? The brain is how you process information in the world. And so I think the information in the world has changed and, and your expectations, you know, has have changed and you learn to interact with new technologies, you know, learning to how to use the phone requires you to learn something, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not bad, right? The kids coming through are not wired in a bad way. They just have learned certain things and they come into the classroom with expectations about what the world should be. So if this phone is the thing that I've learned with since I was six months old, right? I, if I have to put this phone away, that's the device I've used in interacting with my parents, interacting with my grandparents, interacting with my siblings. If I'm putting this away when I come in the classroom and being told this is bad, right? This isn't for learning, then you're really setting up expectations of, but that's where all my fun happens. That's where all my learning happens. And so I think embracing these devices is important when this device is how I learn about the world. Right? So it's not necessarily about how the brain is wired, but the expectations you come in with. And you're competing with you know, really great and engaging video games. Right? You need learning to feel as fun as a video game right? in the classroom. And I think it's possible. And I think that we're getting closer and closer every day to sort of bringing the fun back into the educational process. I, lo I love it. love the way you said that because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think the way the neurons are connected or we make nor neurons connect in our brains have changed much. Um, but the media is different. The, the process is there is certainly different. And there's a lot more of it. So I guess competing, the, the more media competition now is, is certainly a challenge. But well, well said. So maybe that's forcing all of us to up our game a little bit in terms of understanding how and where to use the technologies and integrate them as a natural part. Because I think you're exactly right. They're coming in with these, these devices attached to their heads, pockets, everything. And, and to ignore that is, A, we're missing out on a tremendous resource, but also it's not a natural for our students. It's like trying to separate the, the two pieces. Yeah, yeah, very, very nice. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I drew on Elizabeth only because I knew of her background here. So we put her on the spot. Hey, I've got one last question for you, if you would, Rich. Um, from your experience in this, in this blended learning environment in the K-12, if I'm brand new to this and I'm, I'm thinking about blended learning, I'm kind of you know, intrigued by the idea, what's your biggest takeaway? What's the one thing you'd say, Larry, make sure that you, 
what would that be in order to design the best blended learning experience that I can come up with? Yeah, I think good good point. And there's so many places you can start that would be a, a place of success or a good place to start. I, I don't I don't think when I say move fast, that means uh, move everything fast. When I say move fast, it means you know what? Embrace what's happening now and start, because you can't get past the start until you get to the start line. So starting is important. It can be as simple as, and in fact, new, new teachers, I will often say. Don't try to adapt, adopt more than f five new processes. You know, shoot for three this year. Maybe you're having your students publish their work online to try to go towards paperless. There's growth that happens in that process for you and your students. Maybe this means, you know, homework now instead of um, reading four nights a week, there's reading two or three nights a week, and there's an analysis of a video on YouTube another night of the week. That's a small step, but you're moving. And you're, you're starting to, to make movement and then always focus on growth. I think that's it. You know, different content areas, different opportunities lend themselves to the, to the content a little easier. Certainly we've seen a lot from Khan Academy and, and math and, uh, and things like that. I think there's a plenty of opportunity. Just grab something. Move fast in terms of getting something that fits what you're trying to accomplish. Helping, and, and you know what, this is the district's responsibility, help those teachers, right, have somebody that can say to them, well, what's your big goal? What are you trying to do? And you know, what's not working well in your classroom? And maybe we can optimize it a little bit. Maybe we can engineer it so technology does make your life easier. Um, and do those things. Can be a thousand different ways to start, but I think the start is the most important. Yeah. And if I could add to that, would you also agree yes. with? Um, would you also agree with? You know, um, if it doesn't work, if for whatever reason, if it doesn't work, if for whatever reasons or uh, failures, that you learn from that and you come back and, and you try it again next year. Uh, you, you you know, you don't you don't not do it because you're afraid of the failure. You do it, you fail, and and that's a part of it. And then you you reiterate until you get it done uh, the right way. Yep, definitely. And I uh, just wanted, I didn't want to leave Jerry out in the cold there. His last observation was well said. You have to use what you learn, right? And I think that's why this gamification process uh, is so uh, uh, popular. I think it was Elizabeth, I think her name was, I apologize, but was sharing, um, you know, uh, you know, so this gamification process, this uh, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. It gets back to that retrieval process of formative assessments and all of these kind of things. It's a well said, well said point. Uh, and, Interesting how all these ideas come back together and, and loop back around to something that we previously talked about because good instruction hasn't changed. The modalities may have, but great instruction remains the same. Yeah. And uh, with that, Rich, let me uh, thank you. Uh, very stimulating. Lots of good ideas here. I still have a short list of uh, questions, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll save those for another time. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and, and sharing with us some of your experiences. I'm, I'm really, really grateful that there are people like you uh, who are working in the K-12 environment, uh, getting our faculty members and our teachers geared up and ready to manage this, but most importantly, impacting the students and the learners, uh, the, the, the kids we're going to have in our classrooms the next years uh, coming up and having them uh, really skilled and competent with the whole range of learning that they need to be able to embrace uh, today's education system. And I hope we're up to the task. So I, I look forward to that. So thank you, Rich. Uh, thank yeah, you. Definitely. It was my pleasure, Larry. Rich, uh, thank you. For, we, we will put up the post of this recording in the next. Thank you all. We'll put up the post of this recording in the next. Uh, uh, we'll sign off for today. Thank you so much.